racist. He has called the squad racist. He has called Senator Elizabeth. We look at the impact of their policies and the groups uh, that uh, years ago were, uh, were advocating for these policies. Uh, you, you see their roots in prejudice and racism, and, and, and you see why yeah. so many uh, people of color are concerned about Yeah, you them. brought up a really good point, and to that I want to go to Jason on this for a moment, because uh, you were talking about whether it's fair or effective. I can assure you that the president has used the word racism in very unfair ways to try to be effective in trying to mobilize his base. Here are some of the people that he has called racist. He has called Elijah Cummings racist. He has called the squad racist. He has called Senator Elizabeth Warren a racist. He has called President Barack Obama a racist. Hollywood he called racist. African nations, he called racist. Uh, the 2017 protests in Charlottesville, the violent protesters there, and David Duke. Uh, so going to your point, Jason, about fair versus effective, the president has weaponized the word racism. He calls Democrats socialists all the time. Why doesn't the same thing apply to him that you brought up earlier? It does. But let's be very clear. It didn't start with Donald Trump. Uh, I, I recall it being argued that Mitt Romney was a racist. I recall it being argued that George W. Bush was a racist. This has gone on for a long time. And I maintain my point earlier, even though what was really laid out and made clear earlier in our conversation, was, and I, I, it was amazing, the honesty. Because I'm white, I'm not supposed to have an opinion on this, and I'm supposed to shut up. That's the ultimate goal here. But I maintain my opinion. It's not effective. We ought to talk about the policies. We ought to talk about actual actions. And the default, it seems, on the left is that if you agree with a policy, yes, that may disproportionately impact a community of color, that it's automatically racist. And that's just not so. And I'm just simply arguing in the marketplace of political discourse, it absolutely, and I didn't say that it does it that I was worried about Democrats and Republicans. I'm talking about people in the middle, people we need to engage in this discourse. Even when we use labels like conservative, liberal, socialist, far right wing, all of these labels really cause people to put filters up and not listen. And I think it would be healthy for our overall discourse, particularly at this point in time, when we have historic levels of just polarization yeah. that we go to the heart of the issues and set some of the labels aside. Let's talk a little bit about the immigration debate, but I'll give you a chance to Chris, respond, but, Dean, because so that was Jason, a point. Jason, what word would you prefer instead of racist and bigoted, instead of white supremacists? Is there a word that you find more politically correct that you would like us to use to describe Donald Trump's racist, bigoted no, things? Because that's what I, I want to know. Because you're And no one's saying you can't speak out because you're white. That's a, I'm saying you've got white privilege. God bless you. I used to have it before 9-11. I'm not a, I'm a minority. I, I, I'm Arab I, 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 would, I would argue, you tell me my growing up in a trailer park in Northeast Texas, being the first person in my family to go to college, working two full-time jobs to put myself through college, and that's white privilege? Yes, because on site, people look at you and see a white man. And again, I want to stress the point right. that nobody told I you. Right, I, I understand that. Nobody told you yeah, that you, you have did. to be quiet. You did. You I, said I didn't, you don't, actually. You let me, let me have just an opinion what I said. on this matter. Yeah, let that me just correct what, what I said. said. Let me correct what you heard and, and correct what I said. Um, you, uh, are, I'm saying when, when people are saying that things are not racist and you are not on the receiving end of that, I don't believe it is your place to tell millions of people of color that something or someone is not racist when you are not on the end of it, as have been many uh, communities of color across this country. It does seem a bit out of pocket to me. And the fact that when you say that, when you point that out, like maybe because you don't experience this, you don't recognize it for what we do. And the, the reaction that people get, even that is a level of privilege. Like, how dare you say I can't weigh in on this? Well, yeah, kind of. And it's it, kind of like somebody, uh, it, it, like me having an opinion about something happening in your family. I would be out of place on something like that. So no one's telling you you can't have an opinion. I'm saying it, your I opinion could, uh, is... Uh, uninformed. All right, Jason, Just don't go ahead. Voices. If I could break in, if I could break Hold in on, and speak Jason, for a you, minute. I will. One second, Eric. I just want to give Jason a chance to respond because this was kind of uh, going back and forth. So, Jason, if you wanted to say something specifically on the point that Tiffany raised, go ahead. Got nothing else to say. All right, Eric, you wanted to jump in into what this. I, what what I would say is that um, I, I, people of color often have to deal with systemic racism and prejudice in all sorts of areas of life, from education uh, to employment. And uh, it's important, I think, 
to, to listen to those voices because I believe that people of color are the canary in the coal mine for American society when it comes to racism and prejudice. We are affected by things first that eventually come to affect all of society. And I, and I think a, a better way to say this would be, would not to say that the, the white people shouldn't be a part of this conversation sh or shouldn't have an opinion. You definitely should have an opinion. You, you definitely should be engaged in this conversation. But you should also pay heed to people who have dealt directly and personally with racism and prejudice personally because we have a, a perspective on it that is different and closer and more intimate. We thought about it more often perhaps than, than you have in the same way that a, that a woman might have more insights about sexism than a man might have. And it doesn't mean that a man can't be a part of the conversation. It does mean that women have a, uh, have a more intimate knowledge of how that works in society.